my name's Fraser. So a bit about me, uh, I'm a developer at Red Hat. I work on the free IPA identity management suite and the dog tag uh, certificate system. At work, I am mainly using Python and Java, uh, but in my free time, uh, I'm writing a lot of Haskell. Okay, so this talk is part experience report, uh, part functional programming advocacy, and uh, part open data advocacy. So we're gonna briefly look at what Haskell is uh, and why uh, those of us who are writing Haskell think that it's great and important. Uh, we'll have a look at some implementation details of our GovHack project. And then uh, before wrapping up, there'll just be a bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the Haskell web technologies. Okay, so Haskell is a functional programming language, which means that it uses a, uh, um, a paradigm where uh, the execution of a program is treated as the evaluation of mathematical functions. Uh, it has a strong static type system uh, and a very expressive type system. So um, you may be familiar with Java's type system. Haskell's is uh, much, much better, much more expressive. You can encode a lot more in the types. Uh, it's pure, which means that programs have no side effects. Um, you might wonder how that can be. Uh, I'm not going to cover that in this talk. And it's lazy, so it only evaluates expressions if or when they're needed. And it has high performance, typically within an order of magnitude of C. So why Haskell? The type system prevents many kinds of programmer errors. Uh, I'm happy to admit that as a programmer, I make a lot of mistakes. I think most of us do. Um, therefore, I want tools um, that are going to help me make fewer mistakes, that are going to rule out um, incorrect programs as much as possible. The purity gives rise to referential transparency, which is a substitution of likes. So you can replace any expression with what that expression evaluates to. This gives rise to equational reasoning and the ability to reason about programs at scale. Uh, there are powerful, beautiful abstractions. And if you take the don't repeat yourself mantra seriously, you should really be doing functional programming. Haskell has high quality uh, libraries and frameworks. And for a slightly different slant um, that uh, attacks kind of the concept of functional programming from um, modularity and composability of programs point of view, there's this paper by Hughes from 1984 that I would encourage you to check out. So GovHack. Uh, GovHack is an annual open data event in Australia. So government agencies release uh, data sets. Um, it was on, I think, in August this year, or, or was it late July? And uh, basically, people get together, form teams, and uh, spend a weekend trying to build interesting things or interesting, useful visualizations uh, with these newly released data sets. Uh, there's a competition component, lots of different categories, uh, and some pretty good prize money as well. So all levels of government in Australia are involved, and uh, it's, it's a really, really uh, good initiative. You know, for a long time, all of the data that these agencies collected was just sitting around on disks somewhere. Um, but as taxpayers, you know, we've all paid for that data to be collected. And it's good that they are able to uh, release that data and release its value back to the community and let people with skills like programmers or artists take that data and uh, add value to it as well. Uh, the Brisbane Functional Programming Group is, funnily enough, a functional programming group uh, based in Brisbane. And we ended a team, so there were three of us there. Um, there was Ben, who was a full-time Haskeller. Uh, Sean, who at the time was about to start a full-time job with Haskell. I think he was starting on the Tuesday after GovHack, so uh, good for him. And uh, me, just a Haskell hobbyist. So uh, what was the process of GovHack? The first night uh, was spent deciding what we were going to do for the project. So we started by um, just having a look at the data sets that had been made available, picking out a few interesting ones. Uh, we then had a more in-depth uh, look at some of those shortlisted data sets to see, well, is the data actually going to be useful for starters? And then what's the uh, quality of the data? Like how clean is it, how sane, how easy is it going to be to parse that data uh, into you know, objects that we can work with in the software and do something useful with? We actually encountered a lot of strange um, formats, like weird date formats and stuff. And uh, we thought about 
just writing libraries for parsing and, and working with these formats and just releasing those libraries and doing that as our GovHack project. But in the end, we decided on Brisbane Park Finder. So the idea of Brisbane Park Finder was to search council parks in Brisbane uh, based on their locality and the facilities available at the park. So an example search, find me a park in Chermside uh, with a dog off leash area and some barbecues and uh, that would you know, return a list of candidate parks. You could then view a map of the park and uh, the surrounding district and you could see the different facilities in the park um, marked on the map in icons. Uh, so it lives at uh, brisparks.info, um, but enter if you dare because the UX is terrible, um, although it has been improved slightly since uh, GovHack. Um, and the code lives at GitHub. So this is what it looks like. Um, yeah, I, uh, I did warn you. Um, only engineers could come up with this broken A search paradigm. It, it was pretty terrible. So you just start by typing uh, in the text box. It would look for matches um, in suburb names and then it would include surrounding suburbs as well. And it would also look for matches in park names. Then it would load up in these um, areas at the sides uh, the list of facilities at the park and you could drag and drop them uh, into this region here. Um, to say, oh, I'm interested in this, I want a dog off leash area, or I want um, a climbing frame or whatever. Um, yeah, you can now click it, but yeah, it's, a, it's such a broken search paradigm. But yeah, sometimes these things aren't apparent when you're kind of at a hack fest and it's just like, uh, you know, pass the data, hack, 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 let's, let's get something up and running and you don't realise that actually what you've made is pretty terrible, but anyway. Um, that's the results page, so you get a list of results. In this case, there's only the one park. And um, you can select the park, see the map. It shows you the outline of the park and uh, the different facilities marked on the map with the icons. So this page is yeah, still not particularly nice to look at, but definitely uh, a bit more straightforward than the, the previous example. So the implementation, I'm just going to move very quickly through these slides. Um, I'm not going to explain the Haskell syntax or the particular abstractions that are in use, um, but hopefully you'll get a sense that it can actually be quite elegant. So most of the data sets were CSVs. Uh, there's a Haskell library called Cassava, which is quite nice for parsing CSVs. Uh, this is a data type definition for a facility, so this corresponds to just one record in uh, a CSV that had park facility information. So you can see there we've got the uh, park number, park name, um, the node ID in use, so that's the actual facility and uh, the coordinates down the bottom. And uh, on the right hand side here, these are the type annotations for the types of each of these fields in this record type. Make sense? Okay. So to parse the CSV, um, we instance a class called from named record. Um, this here is the parser, but it's actually made up of smaller parsers. Each of these rows is a different parser for parsing a field out of the CSV, and it's a uh, CSV with the uh, headings. So these are the names of the columns in the CSV. Each of these is a individual parser, and it will infer what has to be parsed um, based on the corresponding uh, type of the uh, component of the record type on the previous slide. So you don't actually have to say, oh, this is an int, this is a um, double, this is a string, the type system can just infer that. So basically you define each of these parsers and uh, glue them all together with these funny looking infix functions and uh, that gives you a type safe parser for a complete facility record. To parse the facilities, um, again I won't go too much into the syntax but basically you can see we're reading the file here, facilities.csv, we're calling this function decode by name with the file contents, and uh, if there's an error, we're just going to put strill on CSV parse error, so we're just going to print that to the terminal. Otherwise, we're going to run with DB, and we're going to map over each of these facilities that comes out and insert it into the database. So this is just part of the import script. Okay, for reading and writing data from the database, um, there's a separate library that we used called PostgreSQL Simple. It's quite low level, it, it really is the most low level um, database library in Haskell. 
So there are other libraries that kind of do this a lot better and a lot nicer um, and um, are less explicit. So they can derive um, the correct instances for um, the classes to read and write data from the database. Similar to the previous one though, we, um, we use this, uh, what's called an applicative um, interface here. And we just say field, 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 field. Um, each of these corresponds to one of the fields in the record type. And again, um, it's going to use the type information um, that the compiler can infer to work out what each of these fields actually means in terms of how it interprets the data coming out of the database. So these ones here correspond to the coordinates. So these will be read as doubles. Um, you know, there were text ones in here and ints and so on. So even though, yes, it does look like we're repeating ourselves here, but each of these fields is doing something different and specific to the corresponding type of that entry in the record type for the facility. Um, again, two row, very similar. We're just basically indexing into our uh, record type now to get the park number, the park name, and so on. Um, building a list here of fields, and then that's what, what gets inserted into the database. To do the query, um, we have this function defined get facilities. Um, we have a special quote syntax here for the SQL. It handles the um, parameterized queries like any sensible um, database querying library uh, must do. And uh, yeah, then we can just uh, apply the query function to that. And then that's going to give us a list of facilities in the context of this uh, DB monad. It's just contextual computation. Uh, in this case, the context is database queries. Okay, so that was very quick. Um, again, haven't gone into a lot of detail, but hopefully you can see um, that the libraries for doing this sort of thing in Haskell are uh, quite easy to work with. Um, you can define your classes and see quite a close correspondence between what you have to write to be able to parse CSVs or to read and write data in a database. Um, close correspondence of those implementations with the actual data types themselves. Okay, so the SNAP framework was the framework that we used um, to actually write the server. So it's a Haskell web framework, it's got a fast web server. Um, Snaplets is the concept that they use to provide a lot of the functionality, um, including uh, sessions and authentication, database access, templating, etc. Um, and it has a scaffolding feature for quick site setup, so you can just say, um, I think it's snap init, and then the name of the site, and it'll just go build you a basic site, just like you can do in Rails and probably Django and a lot of other frameworks. Um, the templating system is called Heist. It has interpolation um, in a you know, fairly reasonable and understandable way, so attributes are interpol interpolated in this way. Um, for actual content in the HTML, it's just like a tag-like syntax. So you know, anyone who's done anything with a templating system should be pretty comfortable um, with Heist. It does some sanity checks at load time. So for example, you know, this is one error I encountered. Um, there's a P inside a div. That's actually not valid HTML. Um, it can detect that and warn you about it, but that's at runtime, and I really wish that these were compile errors. Because um, it's like, oh, if you're gonna do, if you can detect this, I personally would prefer that it do it at compile time and say, sorry, uh, you don't have a program, please go and fix this. Um, some Haskell templating systems do do that. Heist, uh, unfortunately, doesn't. The JavaScript, uh, we originally were going to use PureScript, which is a um, pure, strongly typed uh, functional programming language that compiles to JavaScript. Uh, it's got a similar syntax to Haskell uh, and some similar um, expressiveness, but the sum of the semantics are a bit different. And there's a foreign function interface for safely interacting with the uh, impure kind of JavaScript execution environment that the browser or Node.js will give you. So yeah, in keeping with the theme of using strongly typed functional programming, uh, we initially set out to use PureScript for all our front-end JavaScript. Uh, the only problem was uh, no one actually knew PureScript, and <laughs> we were all trying to learn it on the go, and uh, it was just a bit conceptually dense. So we, uh, I think after the first day, just threw it away and said, oh, let's just write raw JavaScript and get it done. Uh, but since then, I think some of it's been converted back into PureScript, and uh, I'm sure PureScript will make an appearance for GovHack next year. 
So uh, the retrospective, after it all wrapped up and we submitted our project, uh, we went down to the pub and uh, yeah, we had our retrospective because we're so agile and everything. Um, so one of the big points to come out of it was Haskell, everything that was like kind of just the pure Haskell and the snap framework without dealing with the front end was really easy. It just got out of the way. Um, there was also the um, added benefit of um, having a you know, strong compile time uh, type checking so that if your code's compiling, you know, even though you were hacking until 3 a.m. in the morning or whatever, um, as long as the code's compiling, you can kind of go home to bed and come back four hours later and not be too afraid about what you're going to see and what you may have implemented uh, in your uh, tired state. The loss of type safety at the database interface um, did bite us a few times, particularly in relation to geospatial data. Um, but there are some libraries that do a much better job than PostgreSQL Simple, in, in particular one called Persistent. And people are always pushing forward on the front of um, more type safety when dealing with databases or external systems. Um, the UX sucked. We really needed someone with a UX focus. We're going to definitely try and get someone next year, even if we just have to stand up and be like, yo, over here, we need a UX person. Please come help us. Because um, as you can see, we could have done with some help in that department. Um, it was great fun. We're going to do Haskell again next year. If you're interested um, and you want to get involved in GovHack and come to the Brisbane event, um, we'd be happy to have more people on board for sure. Okay, field guide to Haskell web technologies. Again, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Um, the servers, so um, like most languages have their kind of web application interface um, standard, like Rack or Whiskey, um, Haskell has Y, web application interface. Um, yeah, not a very inspirational name. Um, so it gives you application, middleware, request and response types and APIs. It's used by several of Haskell's web frameworks, but not all of them. Um, notably, Snap does not use it. Um, Warp is the HTTP server, kind of touted as the premier Y handler, and they're more or less developed in lockstep. And it's fast. Um, it's very fast. The blue line is Nginx. Um, the green line is um, Haskell's um, Y library at GHC 7.8, which is the latest version of the compiler. Um, this graph's a couple of years old. Nginx, I think, has improved their scaling, um, but Y has improved as well. So, oh, sorry, Warp. Well, um, warp the server here, which is a Y server. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really fast. You don't need to worry about your server performance if you are going to use Haskell and Warp. Um, frameworks, aside from Snap, um, there's your SODE. It gives you type safe routes, URLs, and templates. So um, that was one of the frameworks I was alluding to when I suggested that you could have um, compile time checking for your templates and you know making sure that um, variables you're referencing actually exist. If they don't, um, you're not even going to get a program. Uh, it's got scaffolding as well, uh, a URL there for it. Scotty is a micro framework, kind of in the Sinatra style. Um, it's pretty bare bones, but I've used it and I like it. It's good for small APIs. Hapstack I haven't used, but it, it seems to be one of the other popular frameworks. And if you're just um, making a REST API, there's a library called REST from Silk. And uh, it just lets you define the API. Um, and you can generate client libraries for Haskell, JavaScript, and Ruby. Um, auto documents the API. You can run it on Snap, on Hapstack, or as a native Y application. And uh, yeah, again, a URL there if you are interested. Um, for deployment, uh, you could go the platform as a service option. Um, things are not very mature in this space yet, but there is a community cartridge for OpenShift, um, which is a Red Hat offering. There's Heroku build packs to run Haskell apps. Um, there's FP application server from FP Complete, which as far as I know is the only Haskell centric platform as a service. Um, OpenShift and Heroku have free tiers. Um, FP Application Server, as far as I'm aware, does not. But FP Application Server and OpenShift um, are both built with free software 
that you can take and run your own instances within your own organisation, for example, um, if you wish to, whereas Heroku doesn't have that. Um, there's a link there for more information about the platform as a service offerings. And I also did a lightning talk on uh, Haskell on Pass uh, a couple of months ago, and there's a link to the, my notes for that. Um, Docker might save us all in this regard. Um, there are some cartridge, um, images for uh, Haskell and GHC, which is the main Haskell compiler. So you can search for them on the uh, Docker registry. There is no official language stack for Haskell yet, but I hope to see one one day because um, they already have some language stacks for some pretty weird um, esoteric, well, not, not esoteric, but um, not um, really heavily used languages. So, you know, I think that there is a, enough people out there writing Haskell and wanting to deploy Haskell that it, it makes sense to have an official Docker image, but, well, obviously that's not my decision to make. You can also have some DIY deployment. So Haskell uh, is very easy to compile into a single binary. Um, there's only one shared library, or there, there can be only one shared library, which is libgmp. So as long as you have the same version of libgmp that you were compiled against, and you're compiling for the same operating system and architecture, you can pretty much dump an image on a server and just run it, no worries. Um, but I wouldn't recommend doing what we did for GovHack, which was just uh, running the program inside Tmux um, as root on a Linode. Um, yeah, probably don't do that. So in summary, open data is important and fun. Um, you all have skills in this area, even if you're not a developer. Um, you know, des designers, UX people, um, those skills are really valuable for um, doing interesting, useful things with open data. So I encourage you to be involved. Uh, functional programming matters. And we learned lots of lessons in using strongly typed functional programming with GovHack. We learned that Haskell is a great language for doing that sort of thing. But there are still some areas um, where we're not quite in the promised land yet, particularly when dealing with databases. Um, functional programming and types and good libraries and frameworks are a pretty compelling combination. Uh, deployment options are still a bit immature. And yeah, the big, biggest takeaway for me, don't neglect UX. Um, it's easy to overlook, but your app will be useless if you don't have someone at least paying attention to, to that side of um, the situation. Here are some Haskell uh, resources. So if you want to learn Haskell, um, that's a learning path that I highly recommend. Um, there's a snap quick start guide. Pure Script by example is a Pure Script book. Uh, there's the Haskell wiki for all things Haskell. Um, GovHack lives at govhack.org. And uh, BFPG is the Brisbane Functional Programming Group. Um, we meet monthly. We're on Meetup. And uh, that's the URL to our Meetup page. It just redirects you there. And we're on Freenode at BFPG. So um, come and chat. And uh, we're happy to have as many people as are interested uh, involved. Thank you for listening. Um, that's linked to my slides, um, which are Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 and my email and my Twitter handle. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, you, said, you said that uh, PureScript was close to Haskell's syntax? Yes. Why isn't it just Haskell syntax? Then you wouldn't have to learn a new thing. OK, so the, the problem with um, having to learn a lot was less about the actual syntax and more about dealing with the foreign function interface and some of the semantics that were different between Haskell and PureScript. Um, for example, PureScript, uh, if I remember correctly, is um, strict, uh, so uh, non-lazy uh, evaluation. Um, and yeah, there's the foreign function interface and um, some of the aspects of dealing with the DOM as well, um, which we weren't familiar with. But the syntax itself, if you know Haskell, you'll be very comfortable in PureScript. Um, the sort of uh, web tools like HTTP and REST, to me, um, 
they're very non-stateful and they seem to marry well with the functional side of programming. Um, is is that is that true? Is that truthful from inside a functional programming perspective as well? Um, well, I think that's less a question of what language you're using because um, when you're doing web things in any language, because as, as you've mentioned, it's not a stateful protocol. Um, you know, you kind of have to deal with that statelessness of the request response cycle in any language. So um, it might be the case that it makes perfect sense to use a functional language there. And for people who are using non-functional languages, it's more um, letting go of the idea of stateful computation in order to get to a program that more closely matches the domain that you're in. That being, you know, HTTP, a stateless request response um, protocol. So I don't think that really has much to do with Haskell in particular or f functional programming. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you for bearing with all of the AV problems at the start. Thanks for listening.